What obligation does a climber have when he or she comes upon a fellow climber in extremis? On May 15, 2006, 34-year-old Englishman David Sharp rose to death in Green Boots Cave on the northeast ridge of Mount Everest. Although he was climbing alone, before he left for the peak, he would reassure his mother, stating, You are never on your own. There are climbers everywhere. But at his lowest moment, over 40 climbers would walk past him, and nobody would stop to help. His death ignited a controversy that continues to this day and became one of the most notorious mountaineering stories ever covered. The lessons that were learned that day will be told for generations. This is his story. Born in Harpenden, England near London, Sharp developed a passion for climbing at a young age. By conquering nearby hills, he enjoyed reading about mountains that lay beyond his hometown and dreamed that one day he would have the opportunity to stand on the tallest peaks in the world. He attended Prior Perslove College and would later move on to the University of Nottingham where he pursued a degree in mechanical engineering. While at university, Sharp joined the prestigious Mountaineering Club with the desire for adventure. He would take a break from his personal life and embark on a six-month backpacking journey through South America and Asia. This immersive experience deepened his love for outdoor adventure and would be the catalyst for his future climbs. In 2001, David took on his first major adventure and traveled to the 13th highest peak Gasher Brum II. The mountain is located in the desolate regions of the Karakoram, and simply getting to base camp was a struggle for Sharp. The team was led by experienced mountaineer Henry Todd, and most of the expedition was spent trying to climb the mountain, battling harsh storms and snowfall conditions. Unfortunately, the weather prevented them from making much progress but this seemed to only fuel David's desire to climb. In 2002, David embarked on a grueling expedition to Cho Oyu, a towering 8,188 meter tall Himalayan peak. Led by Richard Dugan and Jamie McGinnis of the Himalayan Project, the team showed great resilience and determination as they faced bad weather conditions and tough terrain. The group managed to conquer the peak, but this would be bittersweet and the first reality check for David. During their expedition, a fellow team member fell into a crevasse and lost his life. An accident that would have an impact on David for the rest of his life. Because of this death, an opportunity arose for David as Richard Dugan needed another climber for an Everest expedition in 2003. David had impressed Dugan despite his small frame and skinny build. The team, led by Dugan, compromised five other climbers, including David. Everest stands as the tallest mountain in the world at 8,848 meters and serves as one of the hardest challenges a mountaineer can ever face. The expedition was doomed from the start. Harsh conditions would begin the first day in the Kumbu Icefall, but throughout their time on the mountain that year, David would excel and prove that he was an exceptional climber. Eventually, two members of the expedition would reach the summit, Terence Bannon and Jamie McGinnis. David, unfortunately, was stopped early by frostbite, eventually leading him to lose several of his toes. But during their descent, David and Dugan would encounter a Spanish climber who was clearly struggling on the steep slope. They would provide him an extra bottle of oxygen and help the man down the peak. The pride and recognition David received that year was almost as important to him as reaching the summit. I did say almost. He appeared to be one of the strongest climbers from the 2003 expedition, and this would begin to inflate his confidence. Don't get me wrong, the dangers of Everest definitely still scared him, but he desperately wanted to conquer that peak. In 2004, David would join a France-Austrian mountaineering expedition to the northern flanks of Mount Everest, led by renowned French climber Hugh Duberade. It was on this trip that David would develop a commitment to solo climbing as well as show skepticism towards using supplemental oxygen. This decision mainly came off the back of his success simply a year prior. This expedition would play a pivotal role in David's life as he was not able to keep up with the other climbers and had to stop at 8,500 meters while all other members reached the summit. Despite his valiant efforts, he would once again be reminded of the risk and harsh conditions as this time the frostbite would affect his hands, serving as a painful reminder 
of his failure. In 2005, David would pivot his career and quit his job to become a teacher. He enrolled in training and planned to start teaching in 2006. Because of this, David was unable to embark on any major expeditions that year. With his desire for adventure building, he desperately wanted to feel the success of an Everest summit. Because of his disagreements with Hugh during his last expedition, and a strong belief in solo climbing, David decided that for his third attempt at the tallest mountain in the world, he would be alone. He also decided that once again, he would be climbing without the use of supplemental oxygen. If you have watched any of my previous mountaineering videos, you would know that only the most elite climbers attempt 8000ers without oxygen support. The risk significantly increases no matter your skills, but David was determined to climb his way. He would join Asian Trekking due to their basic service package that offered limited supplies and be a part of the International Everest Expedition, which compromised of 13 other independent climbers. Due to the basic services, David was given food and supplies up to advanced base camp at 6,340 meters. Beyond that lay hundreds of feet of icy crevasses, steep drops, and towering slopes surrounding him. Near the beginning of May, David would spend five days completing acclimatization trips, traveling up and down the snowy terrain, preparing upper camps. He was also preparing his body for the cold weather and high altitude conditions. David refused to climb with a Sherpa, even turning down a friend's offer for a coordinated expedition and on top of not using oxygen, he also refrained from carrying a radio for emergencies. Before the day of his climb, David's excitement was building as he tossed and turned in his tent, replaying every step from his previous expeditions. His focus was unbreakable. The mesmerizing mountains stood between him and his dream, and when the sun broke the horizon, David set off. The sky was clear and perfect for climbing, although the temperature was much colder than average. Despite not wanting to use supplemental oxygen, David brought along two small bottles for emergencies, although this would only last for about 8 to 10 hours of high altitude climbing, which would not nearly be enough if something went wrong in the rough terrain. It was not until the late evening of May 13th that David initiated his summit attempt from one of the upper camps. His plan involved traversing the notorious exit cracks in the northeast ridges three steps, then making his way to the summit and returning to high camp. It was a daunting task, even for the most experienced climbers, and he had no intention of using his two bottles of oxygen along the way. The early stages of the climb did not prove to be too difficult as David's skills allowed him to scale the mountain with relative ease. But as he got higher, the air became thinner and the challenge got harder. The dangers of climbing a high altitude peak with little to no oxygen can range from headaches to confusion and even hallucinations. Luckily the weather held and there were no major storms but slight snowfall was a common battle on the mountain. As he neared the summit, his progress slowed, but he began to encounter more and more climbers. He had to wait his turn to traverse small sections in some places and a line began to form. Although David was climbing alone, many other mountaineers were chasing after the same goal. The smallest mistake can have deadly consequences. One boot slip on a ledge, you are plummeting down the peak. David was becoming more and more fatigued as the harsh conditions were taking a toll on his energy levels and overall health. He became dehydrated and with the dwindling air, he began to feel disoriented. It was hard to keep focus, but David tried to move his feet one at a time, one after the other. Desperately needing to rest, David stumbled around looking for an area to bivouac. It was in the dead of the night on May 14th when David was ultimately forced to bunk for the night under a rocky outcrop known as Green Boots Cave. The cave lies near the first step at an altitude of 8,500 meters or 28,000 feet. David, no longer caring about not using his oxygen, had depleted his supply quickly. It was experiencing problems with his equipment. The early stages of frostbite were already developing on his hands and toes. And to make matters worse, it was one of the coldest nights of the season. Up until this point, his predicament was unknown for various reasons. He hadn't informed anyone about his summit attempt, and he lacked the means to communicate his location or condition. To make matters worse, two other climbers from his group went missing around the same time, so their attention had been elsewhere. Initially, members from his group just assumed he had taken refuge in a high altitude camp and was resting. 
Since David was a seasoned climber, they thought that if he was in real danger, he would have turned around before things got too dangerous. But as the hours ticked by, it was clear something had gone seriously wrong. Alarm bells did not start ringing until the evening of May 15th, when he had yet to return to camp. That same night, a group of climbers would reach the limestone cave where green boots marked the way, and they would get a nasty shock. When they glanced inside, they realized the long dead climber had company. It was David Sharp. Sharp sat with his arms wrapped around his knees. Icicles hung from his eyelashes, and he did not respond to their shouts. The climbers thought he was already in a coma, but did not radio down to base camp for help. Instead, they left him behind. A mere 20 minutes later, another group came upon Sharp in the cave. Again, they shouted at him to get up and move, but this time, Sharp waved them off, not saying a word. A further 36 climbers were traveling towards the peak that day, some of whom attempted to speak to Sharp, and whose varying accounts of his condition would generate some of the controversies after his death. The bodies that lay frozen on the mountain's peak show how hard rescue can be. They often lay where they fell, since those above certain altitudes are simply too difficult to remove. The same holds true for struggling climbers who reach the mountain's death zone. Eventually, another climber and his team would stop in the cave on their descent from the summit, and after seeing Sharp, they quickly realized that there was nothing they could do. The climbers sat with him and prayed until they were forced to leave or risk their own life. As he left the cave, he radioed down to base camp, and the only thing those listening could do was weep. The main controversy regarding David's death was the sheer number of climbers who saw him while still alive. At least 40 others passed by him in the cave and did little to help him. Unfortunately, we will never know if he could have potentially been saved, but we do know he was never given the chance. Sir Edmund Hillary, the first climber to reach Everest's summit, was particularly disgusted by the attitudes of the climbers who passed by Sharp. He would state, people just want to get to the top. On my expedition, there was no way that you could have left a man under a rock to die. The other side of the argument is that David put himself in that position and failed to prepare for a worst case scenario by refusing to correctly inform others of his climbing schedule or simply bring a radio with him. But even if a rescue attempt might have been launched, it would have had to wait until sunrise, many hours after David climbed into the cave. By that time, his condition would have even been more hopeless. Whichever side you fall on, there is no doubt that there are lessons to be learned from David's climb and story. For many of us, this is just another reason not to climb mountains, but for those that do, it is important to prepare properly. Now even with proper preparation, a mountain can simply disrupt all your plans, but at least you're putting yourself in the best possible position to be successful. David's life may have come to an end, but his story will be told in the mountaineering community forever.